strange yellow cat. The cat was thin with large, intense eyes which gleamed amber in the light. If you were black, he muttered, I'd welcome you, but get out. The cat's melancholy amber eyes gleamed up at him, but it made no sign and continued to follow. Like all gamblers, Gray was intensely superstitious, although he'd had experience of the futility of all supposedly luck-bringing mascots. But this wretched yellow cat that ought to have been black didn't irritate him as might have been expected. Come on then, you yellow devil, we'll eat together. It was a bitterly cold, misty night, and as Gray stumbled numbly across the street, he noticed that the yellow cat had disappeared. Gave no thought to the incident until a few minutes later at the top of the stairs he saw the creature lying across the threshold of his door. He said to himself, that's odd. The cat looked at him impassively with brooding, sullen eyes. Gray opened the door. Silently, the yellow cat rose and entered the shadowy room. There was something uncanny, almost sinister in its smooth, noiseless movements. Gray was a card sharper and professional gambler. But his credit was exhausted. He was cold, hungry, and desperate. Presently, his clothes, the last possession, would betray him, and no longer would he be able to borrow the casual trifle that started him nightly in his desperate bout with fortune. At first, Gray couldn't see the cat. As he lit the small gas ring, which was the room's sole luxury, it jumped noiselessly to the floor, approached and stretched its lean, yellowish body very softly, but plaintively, it began to mew. Gray cursed it. Then he turned to the cupboard and took out a cracked jug. He poured out the little milk it contained into a plate. The cat drank with the fierce rapidity which betokens hunger and thirst. Gray watched it idly as he poured whiskey into a cup. He drank and refilled the cup. The cat looked up. Gray became uncomfortably aware of its staring yellow eyes. Seized with a crazy impulse, he poured the whiskey from his cup into the remainder of the milk. Share and share alike, he cried, drink you. And the yellow cat snarled at him. And Gray was for a moment afraid. Then he laughed as if to himself for allowing his control to slip. The cat went to the foot of the bed, its eyes gleaming warily in Gray's direction. Usually, the morning found Gray profoundly depressed and irritable. For some unaccountable reason, he felt now almost light-hearted. He counted his money and decided to obey an impulse to buy food for the cat, and at the cost of a few pence, added a portion of raw fish to his purchases. On the way home, he was hailed by a voice he'd almost forgotten. Gray, just the man I want to see. You have a drink? I've just touched Lucky. A little later, Gray emerged from the public house, the richer, by five pounds which the other had insisted on lending him in return for past favours. Now, what exactly the past favours had been, Gray was too dazed to inquire. Didn't even remember the man's name. He was still trying to remember who the man was when he climbed the stairs. It was when his eyes alighted on the yellow cat that he suddenly remembered. The man was Felix Mortimer, and Felix Mortimer had shot himself during the summer. Anyway, the five-pound note was real enough. He methodically placed the fish in a saucepan and lit the gas ring. Presently, the cat was eating. Gray, turning the five-pound note in his hand, wondered whether the cat had, after all, changed his luck. But his thoughts kept reverting to Felix Mortimer. The next few days left him in no doubt. At Granny's, he won steadily. From roulette, he turned to chemin de fer, elated to find that his luck held good. He left Granny's the richer by 200 pounds, his success was the prelude to the biggest slice of luck he'd ever known. He gambled scientifically, striving to reach that high water mark at which he could stop and never gamble again. But somehow, he couldn't make up his mind to leave the poverty-stricken room. He was terribly afraid it would spell a change of luck. He tried to increase its comfort, but it was significant that he bought first a basket and a cushion for the yellow cat for there was no doubt in his mind that the cat was the cause of his sudden transition from poverty to prosperity. In his queer, intensely superstitious mind, the yellow cat was firmly established as his mascot. The days passed, and Gray became ambitious. He was now within reach of that figure he fondly imagined would enable him to forsake his precarious existence, and he decided to move into more civilized surroundings. 
he procured an expensive wicker contraption to convey the yellow cat from the garret to his newly acquired maisonette. It was furnished in abominable taste, but the reaction from sheer poverty had its effect. One day, Gray met a woman who was different from any other woman he'd ever met. Elise Dyer, with her fair skin and her deep violet eyes, provoked him into a state of unaccustomed bewilderment. They talked one night of mascots. Gray, who'd never mentioned the yellow cat to a soul, whispered that he would, if she cared, show her the mascot which had brought him his now proverbial good luck. The girl agreed with eager enthusiasm to go to his flat. Together they took a cab to the flat, and Gray felt that he had reached the pinnacle of triumph. Life was wonderful, glorious. What did anything matter now? But as they entered the room, the cat seemed aware of something unusual, regarding them with a fierce light in its eyes. The girl screamed, For God's sake, take it away, she cried, I can't bear it. She began to sob wildly and retreated towards the door. At this, Gray lost all control and, cursing wildly, seized the animal by the throat. Now, don't cry, don't cry, dear, he panted Gray, holding the cat. I'll settle this swine soon enough. Wait for me. Gray ran through the deserted streets. The cat lay inert in his hands, its yellowish fur throbbing. He scarcely knew where he was going. All he realised was an overwhelming desire to be rid of the wretched creature. Not far from Gray's new establishment ran the Prince's Canal. To the canal he ran, and without hesitation he threw the yellow cat into the water. The next day he realised what he'd done. You're a coward, he thought. Why don't you act like a man? Go to the tables. See for yourself that you can still win. That night he received a vociferous welcome on his return to the Green Bay's club. But it was as he feared he lost steadily. Then suddenly an idea came to him. Supposing the cat was still alive? Why, there was a saying that every cat had nine lives. For all he knew, it might have swum safely to the bank and gone away. After what seemed an interminable delay, he reached the spot where he'd flung the cat into the canal. The stillness of the water brought home to him the futility of searching for the animal here. The thing preyed on his mind in the days that followed. Exhaustive inquiries failed to discover the least trace of the yellow cat. Night after night, he went to the tables, lured there by the maddening thought that if only he could win... He would drug the torment and be at peace, but he lost. And then one day a strange thing happened. Gray didn't get out of his bed until late in the afternoon. He crossed the room and caught sight of himself in the glass of his wardrobe. Only then did he realize that he was clambering over the floor with his head near the carpet, his hands outstretched in front of him. He stood upright with difficulty and reached a shaking hand for brandy. It took him two hours to struggle into his clothes, and by the time he was ready to go out, it was nearly dark. He crept along the street. The shops were closing. He reached the corner where he halted abruptly with a queer sensation of intense hunger. On the cold marble before him lay unappetizing slabs of raw fish. His body began to quiver with suppressed desire. Another moment, and nothing could have prevented him seizing the fish in his bare hands when the shutters of the shop dropped noisily across the front of the marble surface. Gray knew that he was very ill. Now that he couldn't see the vision of the yellow cat, his mind was a blank. Somehow he retraced his footsteps and got back to his room. The bottle of brandy stood where he'd left it. He'd not turned on the light, but he could see it plainly. He dragged it to his lips. With a crash, it went to the floor, while Gray leapt into the air, savage with nausea. He felt he was choking. With an effort, he pulled himself together to find that it was beyond his power to stop the ghastly whining sound that issued from his lips. He tried to lift himself onto the bed, but in sheer exhaustion, collapsed on the floor, where he lay still in an attitude not human. A whole day passed before he moved. He stared at his hands. The fingers seemed to have withered. The nails had almost disappeared, leaving a streak of hornish substance in their place. In the fading light, he saw that the backs of his hands were covered with a thin, almost invisible surface of coarse, yellow fur. Unimaginable horrors seized him. The thread of his brain was being stretched to breaking point. Presently it would snap, unless... The yellow cat alone could save him. To this last human thought, he clung in an agony of terror. 
He groped his way stealthily towards the one place which the last remnant of his brain told him might yield the secret of his agony. Down the silent bank he scrambled headlong towards the still water. On the edge of the canal he halted, his eyes searching the depths of the motionless water. There he crouched, searching, searching. And there, in the water, he saw the yellow cat. He stretched out the things that were his arms, while the yellow cat stretched out its claws to enfold him in the broken mirror of the water.